The following is a reading of a chapter from Heaven Open by Richard Allain, who lived from 1611 to 1681. Richard was the father-in-law and uncle of Joseph Allain, the author of An Alarm to the Unconverted. I've narrated this chapter numerous times. In fact, it was the very first digital audio narration ever put on the Internet back in 2003. The message is so powerful, I have read it a number of times over the years. The reading is taken from Ezekiel 36, 26. I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. The old heart is a stone, cold as a stone, dead as a stone, hard as a stone. But I will take away the stone and give a heart of flesh. A heart of flesh is a soft and tender heart. Flesh can feel. Anything that is contrary to it puts it to pain. Sin makes it smart. It cannot kick, but it is against the pricks. By its rebellion and resistance against the Lord, it receives a wound. It cannot hit, but it hurts itself. A soft hand gets nothing by striking a hedge of thorns. A soft heart, when it has been meddling with sin, is sure to smart for it. It can neither escape the pain nor yet endure it. And what it cannot bear, it will take warning to avoid. Flesh will bleed. A soft heart will mourn and melt and grieve when hard hearts are moved at nothing. Flesh will yield. It is apt to receive impressions. The power of God will awe it. His justice alarm it. His mercy melt it. His holiness humble it. And is the attributes. So the word and works of God will make sign upon it. Who sets a seal upon a stone? Or what print will it receive? Upon the wax, the print will abide. God speaks once and twice, but man, hardened man, will not regard it. Neither his word nor his rod, neither his speaking nor his smiting will make any impression on such hearts. It is the heart of flesh that hears and yields. And with such hearts the Lord delights to be dealing. The heart of this people is waxed gross. Acts 28, 27 They will not hear. They will not understand. And the next word is, Away to the Gentiles. They will hear. He will no more write his law on tables of stone. He will write in flesh. There the impression will take, and go the deeper. And therefore, wherever he intends to write, he prepares his tablet. Make this stone flesh, and then engrave upon it. Particularly this tenderness admits of a double distinction. First, respecting the object of it. There is a tenderness as to sin, duty, and suffering. Number one, as to sin. And this discovers itself both before the commission of it and after committing it. Before the commission, while it is under temptation or feels the first impulse to sin, a tender heart startles, starts back at the sight of a sin, as at the sight of a devil. How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Genesis 39 verse 9 This manner of speech presents Joseph as a man in a fright, startled at the ugliness of the sin. So David, when he had an opportunity and a temptation to slay Saul, rejects it with a, God forbid, the Lord forbid that I should stretch forth my hand against the Lord's anointed. 1 Samuel 26, verse 11. And a tender conscience not only shrinks at the higher and greater sins, but it resists the little ones, the smallest of sins. Is it not a little one? Is no plea with it. Little or great, it is a sin, and that is enough. There is also a tenderness as to sin after its commission, 
If it has been brought on by an act of sin, yet it cannot cease with it. The skirt of Saul's garment was too heavy for David's heart to bear. His heart smote him at once. 1 Samuel 24, verse 5. Sin, in the review of it, looks dreadful. Its pleasant flowers quickly turn to thorns. It pricks the heart, how much soever it please the eye. It ordinarily enters by the eye and often runs out the same way it came in. It runs out in tears. When he thought thereon, he wept. At least it warns one and makes him more watchful afterwards. You see what it is? Take heed. Take it for a warning. And don't do it any more. The pain of sin, if it do not force a tear, will set a watch. Secondly, as to duty, a tender heart will neither slight a sin nor neglect a duty. It is loath to grieve and offend, and careful to serve and please the Lord. It would not that he should suffer by it, nor so much as lose his due. It watches against sin and unto duty. It cares how to please the Lord, and its care is tender. It would not displease by its neglects or performances. All must be done that ought and as it ought to be done. It will neither withhold its offering, nor will it offer an unclean thing. It considers not only what, but how, both matter and manner, substance and circumstance, all must be right or it is not at ease. It is not satisfied that it prays sometimes. It would never lose a praying time. God will not and it cannot lose a duty. It would neither lose by non-performance nor lose what is performed. It would neither leave undone nor do amiss any failing, not only in the matter but in the principal end, affection, tender affection. Any failing pains it. There is a tenderness in point of suffering. A tender heart will not be careful what or how much, but why and upon what account he suffers. It will neither sinfully shun the cross nor run upon it unwarrantably. He waits for a call and then follows. He is patient under the hand of the Lord, but not insensible. He can be touched with an affliction, though not offended at it. The hand of the Lord has touched me. He suffers more than his own sufferings. His brethren's burdens all lie on his shoulders. He weeps in their sorrows, bleeds in their wounds. His heart is bound in their chains. As the care, so the trouble of all the churches come daily upon him. Who is weak, and I am not weak? Who is offended, and I burn not? He espouses all the sufferings of Christ as his own. In all his afflictions, he is afflicted. Roman numeral 2. Tenderness may be distinguished in respect to the subject of it. There is a tenderness of the conscience, the will, the affections. Number one. Tenderness of conscience consists in these three things. Clearness of judgment. Quickness of sight and uprightness or faithfulness. Clearness of judgment when it is well instructed and understands the rule and can thence discern between good and evil. Hebrews 5 verse 14. There is a tenderness that proceeds from cloudiness, a scrupulosity that fears everything, stumbles at straws, starts back at shadows, makes sins, picks quarrels at duties, and so sometimes dares not please God for fear of offending him. This is the sickness or soreness of conscience, not the soundness of it. It is a sound conscience that is truly tender. Such a conscience has quickness of sight and watchfulness. I sleep, but my heart wakes. 
It can espy the least sins and smallest duties. It can see sin in the very temptation. It can discover the least sin under the fairest face and the least duty under the foulest mask. Call it singularity, nicety, cloud it with reproaches, yet conscience can discover light shining through all the clouds and sees duty within, with whatsoever unhandsome face it is presented. Clearness of judgment consists in conscience's understanding the rule, quickness of sight in applying the rule to cases and distinguishing them. The truly tender has his eyes in his head and his eyes open to discover and discern all that comes, be it good or evil, little or great. If but a thought comes in, what's coming in here, says conscience, what are you? Are you a friend or an enemy? Whence art you, from God or from beneath? It will examine whatever knocks before any free admission. Oh, what a crowd of evils do thrust themselves into loose and careless hearts. The devil comes in, in the crowd, and is never discovered. If the eye be either dim or asleep, there is entrance for anything. Little do we think oftentimes who has been with us, and what losses and mischiefs we have sustained while our hearts have been asleep, which, had they been awake and watchful, might have been prevented. A tender conscience is also marked by uprightness and faithfulness, which discovers itself, and giving charge concerning duty. Look to it, soul. There is a duty before you which God calls you to. Do not say, it is no great hurt to let it alone. It is no great hurt to do it. It is questionable whether it be a duty or not. Many wiser than I think otherwise. Don't say it. It is a nicety. It is but a punctilio. It is mere folly and preciseness. And there will be no end of standing upon such small manners. See to it. It is your duty. But were that you neglect it not. The bulking of the least duty is the neglecting of the great God of glory. In giving warning of sin, take heed to yourself. Sin lies at the door. You are under a temptation. The devil is entering upon you. Do not say it is but a little sin. Little as it is, there is death and hell in it. Look to it, it is sin. Have then nothing to do with it. Keep yourself pure, and though it run upon you, shake it off. After the commission of the sin, it gives a rebuke for it, reproving, judging, and lashing a soul for it. Where have you been, Gehazi? Say not, you have been nowhere. Went not this heart with you, and saw you running after your covetousness, gadding after your pleasures, feeding your pride, dandling your lusts? playing the hypocrite, playing the harlot from your God, pampering your flesh, pleasing your appetite. And where have you been? What have you done, soul? Don't think to excuse or mince the matter. It cannot be excused. You have sinned against your God and now bear your shame. This is our heart smiting us. Second Samuel 24, verse 10. Our heart condemning us. If our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. 1 John 3, verse 20. Number 2. Tenderness of the will consists in its flexibleness and pliableness to the will of God. And this is that tenderness in which chiefly lies the blessing of a soft heart. A hard heart is stubborn and obstinate. Your neck is an iron sinew and your brow brass. You will not be ruled. There is no bending you or turning you out of your course. Your iron is too hard for the fire. It will not be melted. And for the hammer, it will not be broken. There is no dealing with you. You are an untractable peace. You will neither be led nor driven. Your heart is set in you to do evil. Your will is set upon sin. 
and you are set upon your own will. You say, The word that you have spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not do. But we will do whatsoever thing goes forth out of our own mouth. Jeremiah 44, verses 16 and 17. Who is Lord over us? Psalm 12, verse 4. Jeremiah 2, verse 25. You say, there is no hope. No, for I have loved strangers, and after them I will go. Come what will of it. Say what you will against it. Be silent. Scriptures, hold your peace. Conscience, it is to no purpose to speak more. There is no hope of prevailing. We are resolved we will take our own course. These are hard hearts, stubborn, obstinate hearts. When the iron sinew is broken, when the rebellion and stubbornness of the spirit is subdued and tamed and made gentle and pliable, then it becomes a tender heart. There may be some tenderness in the conscience, and yet the will be a very stone. And as long as the will stands out, there is no broken heart. Conscience may be scared and frighted. Conscience may fly upon the sinner with, What do you mean, soul? Where are your rebellions carrying you? Look to yourself. Hearken, or you will be lost ere you are aware. But however God has conscience on his side, Yet the devil still rides the will, and their sin takes up its rest. There is a twofold resting of sin in the soul, in peace, and in power. The resting of the soul, in peace, when it dwells and rules in the soul, without disturbance or contradiction, when it carries all smoothly before it, when God lets it alone and conscience doesn't speak a word against it when notwithstanding those armies of lusts fighting against a soul, there is not so much as one weapon lifted up against him, not a prayer, not a tear, nor a wish for freedom, nor the least fear concerning the issue. This is a most dreadful hardness. The resting of the soul in power, when though it can have no peace, yet it still has a place in the heart though it can have no quiet, but conscience is ever quarreling with it and warning it away, yet it still holds its power over the will. The master of the house is content to be its servant. Oh, how many persons are there, even among the professors of religion, who cannot sin in quiet. They are proud or passionate or intemperate or covetous or false in their words and dealings. They are formal and hypocritical and slight in their duties, but they cannot go on thus with any quiet. Conscience smites them for it. They feel many a pang and deadly twinge in their heart, insomuch that sometimes they cry and groan and roar in their spirits, Oh, for redemption! Oh, for deliverance from this false, this proud, this covetous and wicked heart! And yet, after all this, a will remains a captive still. Sin holds its power there, though it cannot reign in peace, though it cannot be proud or play the hypocrite or be covetous, or an oppressor, without some gulls and gripes in the soul. Yet on it goes, the same trade is kept up, the same course is held on. God commands... Cast you out, cast you out, come off from all your wickedness and evil ways, and I will receive you. But no, though conscience would, the will cannot come. Whatever rendings and tearings, whatever tears and torments and worrying such souls are at any time under, whatever stings and plagues and fires they find their sins to be in their souls and bones, whatever wishes they ring forth that they were well rid of these plagues. While the will is still strong, there is a hard heart, desperately hard. There is none of this heart of flesh. But when the will is once broken loose from sin, when it will be content to let all go and give up itself to the dominion of the Lord, there is a broken heart. Now speak, Lord, and I will hear. Now call, Lord, and I will answer. Now command me, impose on me what you will. I will submit. None but the Lord. None but Christ. 
no other Lord, nor other lover. I am yours, Lord, your own. Do with your own, demand of your own, whatever you please. What God will have me to be, what God will have me to do, that will I do and be. No longer what I will, but the will of the Lord be done. When it has come to this, there is a tender heart. There is a blessing of a broken spirit. The stone has been taken away. He has given an heart of flesh. Christians never trust to tears. Never talk of terrors, of trouble of conscience, of the passionate workings and meltings which at any time you feel within your spirits, though there be something in these as you shall see more by and by. Yet those are not the things you are to look at. A subdued, tractable, willing, obedient heart, that is a tender heart. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured with a sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Isaiah 1 verse 19. Number 3. Tenderness of the affections. Of these I shall instance only three. Love, fear, and sorrow. Number 1. The tenderness of love is seen in its benevolence and in its jealousy. In its benevolence, our goodness extends not to the Lord, but our good will does. Our love can add nothing to Him. Can a man be profitable unto God? Job 22, 2. If you be righteous, what do you give to Him? Job 35, verse 7. Yet though it can add nothing, it would not that anything be detracted from him. While he can have no more, it would that he should have his own, all that is due, his due praise, his due honor and homage and worship and subjection from every creature. It would have no abatement, not the least spot or stain upon all his glory. What is an affront to God is an offense to love. Love bears all things, saith the Apostle, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 7. All things from God, all things from men. And yet there are two things which love to God cannot bear, his dishonor and his displeasure. The benevolent heart cannot bear God's dishonor. Love would have God to be God, to live in the glory of his majesty, in the hearts and eyes of all the world. His reproach is grievous to him that loves, for this is a cloud that takes God out of sight. He loves and honors, and would that God should be loved and honored of all. He fears, and would that the whole world should fear him. He would receive in his own breast every arrow that is shot against his Maker. He would that his own name and soul might stand between his God and all reproach and dishonor. He would be vile, if so the Lord may be glorious. That God may increase, he is content to decrease. He is not so tender of his own heart and life, as of the holiness of his God. He would suffer and die and be nothing, rather than that God should not be all in all. He would rather never think nor speak, nor be, than not be in word and thought and life, holiness to the Lord. But oh, what or where would he not be, rather than his own hand should be lifted up against Jehovah, to see the Lord robbed of his holiness, wronged in his wisdom or his truth or his sovereignty, to see sin, to see the world, set up in the throne, and the God of glory made to stand aside is insignificant. To hear that blasphemy, God is not worth this lust, or not worthy this labor, and what less is said in every sin. That is a sword in his breast. The reproaches of them that reproach thee are fallen upon me. Love is tasted of God. It is fed on his fullness. It has its nourishment from his sweetness. It has been warmed in his bosom. All his goodness has passed before it. Upon this it lives and feeds, and having found and felt what the Lord is, 
It is impatient that his goodness should be clouded or belied. Love kindled from heaven is keen, and the keen edge is a tender edge. The least touch of what offends will turn it. I am in distress. My bowels are troubled. My heart is turned within me, for I have grievously rebelled. Lamentations 1 verse 20 My tears have been my meat day and night, while they continually say unto me, Where is your God? Psalm 42 verse 3 Where is that care, that help and that salvation of your God that you trust in? Your God is not such an one as you boast him to be. When I remember, when I hear such things, my soul is poured out within me. Love is large. He that loves has a large heart. He can never receive or do too much. He would have all he can, and he would give all he has to the Lord. He is tender how anything be withheld that is due, how anything be wasted elsewhere that might be useful to the Lord. Nor can love bear his displeasure. This displeasure of men it bears and rejoices. The wrath and rage of Satan it bears and triumphs. Though all the world be displeased and provoked, if God smiles, it is well enough. Lord, lift up thou the light of your countenance upon me, and my heart shall be glad. Psalm 4. You did hide your face, and I was troubled. Psalm 30, verse 7. Let him correct me, but oh, not in fury, let him smite, but not frown. Let him kill me, so he will but love me. And though he smite, though he kill me, yet will I love and trust in him. Oh, my God, let me rather die in your love than live in your displeasure. There is life in that death. This life is death to me. Let me not be dead while alive. Turn away your anger which kills my heart. It is impatient of divine pleasure. And thence, it is grievous to it that it does itself displease him. So it opposes sin and condemns itself for it. Is this your kindness to your friend? Lovest thou God, O my soul? What? And yet provoke him thus daily? Love, and yet neglect to seek and follow your God? Love? and yet so lame and so slow and so heavy and so sparing in your services to him? Is this all your love will do? Not deny your ease or your pleasure or your liberty or your appetite or your companion for the sake of the Lord? Choose rather to please your friend or your flesh than to please God. Is this your love? Is this the kindness to your friend? O oh, false heart! Unworthy, unworthy spirit, how can you look God in the face? How can you say I love you when your heart is no more with him? The tenderness of love is also seen in its jealousy. He that loves the Lord is jealous, and jealousy has a tender edge. He is jealous not of, but for the Lord, not of his God but of himself, lest anything should steal away his heart from God. Love would be chaste, would not bestow itself elsewhere, and yet is in great jealousy, lest it be enticed and drawn away. He that loves the Lord has not anything, whether wife or child or friend or estate or esteem, that gets near his heart, but he is jealous of them, lest they steal it away. Get you down, he says. Keep you lower. This heart is neither yours nor mine. Oh, my God, it is yours. It is yours. Lord, take it wholly to you. Keep it to yourself. Let no other lovers be sharers with you. Number two. There is a tenderness of fear. The tender heart is a trembling heart and manifests the tenderness of fear and its suspicion and its caution, in its suspicion, the fearful are suspicious. They look further than they see. He that is in dread will be in doubt what may befall him. He suspects a surprisal. Every bush is a thief. Every bait he fears may have a hook under it. 
There is a foolish and causeless fear, and there is a prudent and holy fear. This fear is a principle of wisdom, Psalm 111, verse 10. A prudent man foresees the evil, Proverbs 22, verse 3. But fools go on. The snare is never nearer than to the secure, bold, venturous sinners. Never want for woe. The devil may spare his cunning when he has to do with such. Nothing that looks like sin offers itself to a tender heart, but he presently suspects it. Every pleasant morsel, every pleasant cup, every pleasant companion that comes, anything that tickles and gratifies the flesh, he looks through it ere he will touch it, lest it betray his soul from God. There may be a snare in the dish, a snare in my cup, a snare in my company. And what if there should be? He feeds himself with fear, dwells, walks, converses, works, recreates himself with a trembling heart and a jealous eye. His fear also appears in his caution. Fear is wary. Some commanders have set their scout watches unarmed, that fear might make them watchful. A fearful Christian will take heed what and whom he trusts. He dares not trust himself in such company as may be a snare unto him. He dares not trust his heart among temptations. He will keep the devil at a distance. He will not come near where his nets lie. Blessed is he that thus fears always. Oh, the unspeakable mischief! Oh, the multitude of sins that we run upon through our secure hearts! I never thought of it. I never dreamed of any such danger. Oh, I am undermined. I am overreached. I am surprised. My foot is in the snare. The gin has taken me by the heel. My soul is among lions. Sin has gotten hold on me. My heart is gone ere I was aware. The enemy has come in and carried it away, has given it to lust, to the world, to pleasure, to divide it among themselves. My faith has failed. My conscience is denied. My love has grown cold. My grace is withered. My comforts wasted. My peace broken. And my God, oh, where is he gone? Woe is me. The evil that I feared not is come upon me. Had I feared, I had not fallen. Oh, that I had been wise, that I would kept my watch, has stood upon my guard. Had I thought, had I thought, I had escaped all this danger. Oh, Christians, be wise in season and take heed of the fools. Too late, had I known it. Number three, there is a tenderness of sorrow. Sorrow is a melting of the heart, the stone dissolved. Sorrow is a wound of the heart, a wound is tender, love is tender, and therefore so is godly sorrow, which is the sorrow of love. You may call it a love sickness. Love is both the pain and pleasure of a mourning heart. It is love that wounds and love that heals. It is both the weapon and the oil. The sorrow has its joy. The melted is a most joyful heart. It is love that makes it sad. It weeps because it loves. And it is love that makes it glad too. It therefore joys because in its sorrows it sees that it loves. It is love that makes the wound. The occasion of the sorrow being love abused. What have you done, soul? Whom have you despised? Against whom have you lifted up yourself? You have sinned, you have sinned, and you have thereby smitten and grieved your God that loves you, and whom you love. You have but one friend in heaven and earth, and him you have abused to please your lust. You have pierced your Lord, you have transgressed his commandments, trampled upon his compassions, and broken his bonds. His greatness and His goodness, His law and His very love have been despised by you. He who loved you, you are smitten. Is this your kindness to your friend? O oh, vile, ungracious, unkind, unthankful, unnatural heart, what have you done? Put all this now together and you have the heart of flesh. 
which the covenant promises, a tender heart, a heart that is tender of sin and duty, that carefully shuns sin, or is sure to smart for it, that neither slights sin nor duty, that says not of the one or the other, it is but a little one, that can feel sufferings but not fret at them, a tender conscience that will neither wink at sin nor excuse a sinner, that will not hold a sinner guiltless nor say unto the wicked, You are righteous, that will not be smitten, but it will smite again, that will give due warning and due correction, a flexible, tractable heart that will not resist and rebel, that says to the Lord, What will you have me to do? And will not say if anything God wills, anything but this, a willing, ductile heart, stiff against nothing but sin, that a word from heaven will lead to anything, a heart of love that bears good will to the Lord, and all that he does or requires, in which good will lies radically every good work, that doesn't say of any duties or sufferings, this is too great, or of any sin, this is nothing, that would be anything or nothing, so God may be all, that would rather be displeased than displeased, that is not displeased when God is pleased, a trembling heart that fears more than it sees and flies from what it fears, whom fear makes to beware, a melting heart, a mourning heart that wounds itself in the wounds that is given to the Lord in His name, that can grieve in love, and can love and grieve where it cannot weep. In some, it is a heart that can feel, that can bleed, that can weep, or at least that can yield and stoop where it cannot weep, nor feel but little, that will be easily commanded where it is not sensibly melted. This is a soft heart. This is a heart of flesh. I will take away the stone and give them a heart of flesh. Oh, what a blessing is such a heart. What a plague is a hard heart. Oh, what prisoners are the men of this world. In prison under Satan. In prison under sin. Bound under a curse. Shut up under unbelief and impenitence. The hard heart is the iron gate that shuts them in that they cannot go out. Romans 2 verse 5. Oh, what a hospital is this world become of blind and lame, sick and crippled and wounded creatures. Whence are all the calamities and distresses that befall them, but from the hardness of their hearts? The stone in their hearts breeds all their diseases, brings all their calamities, has blinded their eyes and broken their bones and wasted their estates. There is not one misery that befalls them, but they may write over it. This is the hardness of my heart. Oh, what a Sodom has this world become for wickedness as well as for wrath. What drunkenness, what adulteries, what oaths, what blasphemies and all sorts of monstrous sins do everywhere abound. Whence is all this but from the hardness of men's hearts? If you say, it is from other causes, it is from unbelief, from ignorance, from impotence, from temptations, let it be granted, yet still it is from hardness of heart. They're willfully ignorant, willfully weak, willfully run into temptations. They shut their eyes and stop their ears. They will not see. They will not believe. Oh, what losses do they sustain? How many Sabbaths are lost? How many sermons are lost? How many reproofs, counsels, corrections are lost? A gospel lost, and souls by it likely to be lost forever. Oh, what prodigies are they become under all this sin and misery? And yet merry, jolly, laughing and singing and sporting and feasting and braving it out, as if nothing ailed them, feeling nothing of all that has come upon them, and fearing nothing of all that is coming. Warn them, reprove them, beseech them, it is all but preaching to a stone. It may be you have sometimes wondered to see a company of thieves in prison, drinking and carousing and making merry, when they know that in a few days they must be brought out and be hanged. 
When you wonder at these, wonder at yourself. What bitter complaints do we sometimes hear, even from the best of saints? Oh, this hard heart. Oh, this stubborn spirit. I cannot mourn. I cannot stoop. I cannot submit. Why have you hardened our heart from your fear, Isaiah sixty three seventeen, Or why have you left us or given us up to a hard heart? Why have you not softened and humbled and broken us? You have humbled us, and we are not humbled. Broken us, and we are not broken. You have broken our land, broken our peace, broken our backs, but the stone is not yet broken. Oh, for one breach more. Lord, our hearts, our hearts, let these be once broken. Our streets mourn. The cities of our solemnities mourn. The ways of Zion mourn. Oh, when will you give us a mourning spirit? Oh, what sorrow-bitten souls are the saints for lack of sorrow. I mourn, Lord. I lament. I weep. But it is because I cannot mourn or lament as I should. If I could mourn as I ought, I could be comforted. If I could weep, I could rejoice. If I could sigh, I could sing. If I could lament, I could live. I die, I die, my heart dies within me because I cannot cry. I cry, Lord, but not for sin, but for tears for sin. I cry, Lord, my calamities cry, my bones cry, my soul cries, my sins cry, Lord, for a broken heart. And behold, yet I am not broken. The rocks rend, the earth quakes, the heavens drop, the clouds weep, the sun will blush, the moon be ashamed, the foundations of the earth will tremble at the presence of the Lord. But this heart will neither break nor tremble. Oh, for a broken heart. If this were once done, might my soul have this wish. Thenceforth my God might have his will. What would be hard if my heart were tender? Labor would be easy. Pains would be a pleasure. Burdens would be light. Neither the command nor the cross would be any longer grievous. Nothing would be hard but sin. Fear. Where are you? Come and plow up this rock. Love, where are you? Come and thaw this ice. Come and warm this dead lump. Come and enlarge this straightened spirit. Then shall I run the way of his commandments. O oh, brethren, how little, how very little of this tenderness is there to be found in most Christians. The sacrifice of God is a broken heart. Oh, how far must the Lord go to find himself such a sacrifice? We do but cast stones up to heaven when we lift up our hearts. It is a wonder that such hearts as we carry do not break, that our marble weeps not, that if nothing else will do it, our hardness does not make us relent, that we should so labor under and complain of and yet not be sick of the stone. Broken hearts. Yielding and relenting spirits, tender consciences, oh, where are they? Afraid of sin, tender of transgressing or mourning under it. When shall it once be? Our lusts no more broken, our pride, our passion, our envy, our earthliness no more broken. So venturous on temptation, so bold on sin, such liberty taken to transgress. Such mincing and palliating and excusing of sin as we find. Is this our brokenness? We are tender, it is true. But of what? Of dishonoring God? Of abusing grace? Of neglecting duty? A defiling conscience of wounding our souls? No, it is of our flesh that we are so tender. Tender of labor. Tender of trouble. Tender of our credit, of our name and reputation. A tender shoulder we have, a tender hand, a tender foot that can bear nothing and do nothing. Nothing can touch our flesh. Nothing can touch our idols, our ease, or our estates, but we shrink and smart and are put to pain. God be smitten and we feel it not. The gospel may be smitten, the church may be smitten, conscience may be smitten, and it moves us not. We can fear an affliction. Fear a reproach. Oh, that we so much feared a temptation or a sin. We cannot lack bread, but we feel the want. 
We cannot want clothes or a house or a friend, but we feel it. We cannot want our sleep, our quiet, our pleasure, our respect from men, but we feel it. Anything that pinches our flesh pierces our heart. We cannot pine or languish in our bodies, but we feel it. A fever or an egg, a consumption, dropsy, or any bodily sickness. Oh, it makes us sick at heart. A froward yoke fellow, an unthrifty servant, an ill neighbor, a scoff, a slight, cannot be borne. But oh, how much sin can be borne, while our flesh will bear nothing. How much can conscience bear and never complain? Christians, consider. When our flesh must be thus caressed, whatever come of it, must be tenderly fed, must have soft raiment, soft lodging, soft usage, be dealt gently with, though to maintain it, conscience must be racked and racked and wasted. When our wills cannot be crossed, our appetites cannot be denied, but a tumult follows. The soul is in an uproar, and conscience, meanwhile, must be denied and sent away in silence. When the word of the Lord works no more, when the prints of it are not received, the power of it resisted, when the rod works no more, when our stripes make no sign, when the lashes on our backs don't touch our hearts, when we can remain so vain and so wanton, so willful, carnal and earthly, after the Lord has been preaching and chastising us into a better frame, when we stand upon our terms, keep our distances, our animosities, our hearts and heights of spirits, our censorings, our quarrelings one with another, Christian with Christian, professor with professor, after the Lord has been beating us together to make us friends, and all to teach us more humility and charity. Is this our brokenness? Is this our tenderness? When upon any of the Lord's rougher dealings with us, smiting our faces, throwing us on our backs, trampling us in the dirt, were he yet no more broad on our knees? Is this our brokenness when the Lord has been awakening us out of sleep, putting his spurs and goads in our sides to quicken us on our way, calling to us, Our eyes, sleepers, stir up your spirits, sluggards, mend your pace, I will not be put off as I have been. No more such loitering and idling and trifling and halting as has been. I must have another manner of service, of praying and hearing and walking and working, than has been. Be zealous and amend. More labor, more care, more watchfulness, more activity, more of the spirit and soul of what you profess. When the Lord has been thus goading and spurring us on, and though our flesh feels, yet our hearts will not feel, nor answer the goad or spur? Is this an evidence of tenderness? When great duties are little, and lesser are none? When great sins are infirmities, and little ones are nothing? When lying and defrauding? When false weights, false wares, and false dealings? When defaming, backbiting, tail-bearing, railing, reviling, do stand for little more than ciphers? When fellowship and familiarity with evil men and their sins and compliance with or connivance at their wickedness, when sinful courtings and complimentings of such to the hardening of them in their ways pass for virtues and civilities, when frothy wanton discourse and communication, when scoffing and making a sport at the sins or infirmities of others, when sinful vain jesting wherein rather conscience and wit must be denied, when all these pass for our ornaments rather than our evils, where is our tenderness? A heart of flesh. Richard Elaine, 1611 from 1681. From the book, Heaven Opened.